now uh, two o'clock. I'd like to uh, invite y'all all to please stand for the invocation to be given by the chapter to preach. And following the invocation, if you please remain standing, we're having a special presentation uh, today in recognition of Memorial Day, which we celebrated at the end of this month. Uh, many of you may not know the history of Sarasota Memorial Hospital, but when it was really started in 1924-1925, it was referred to as Sarasota Municipal uh, Hospital. And in 1954, uh, the board uh, made a resolution to change the name to Sarasota Memorial Hospital. And given that we celebrate Memorial Day at the end of this month, I thought it would be appropriate that we would ask the Sarasota Military Academy to present the colors and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Chaplain Preach, thank you. Yours. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you this day and every day for the ability to remember those who have served, suffered, and died for our freedom. Bless now by God. Help us to truly understand and enjoy the inherent responsibility and the resultant joys of freedom. Help us to use this marvelous and costly gift of freedom to do the best we can as a hospital team and, and to care for those and to heal those people and the land in which we live. We do well to remember our brave ancestors who dreamed a dream of freedom and fought against the nightmares of oppression and tyranny so that we might be continued caretakers of this same sweet freedom. Let us be diligent then for the sake of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and for our patients and our families and our service members today. Give us joy as we remember the sacrifice of the past so that those who freely gave that sacrifice receive an eternal benefit, which is a dream of freedom realized by those who breathe that breath and dream that continued dream of freedom today. In the name above every name. Amen. Color Guard, post the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the States of America, to the Republic, which is Saints, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you to the cadets of the Sarasota Military Academy. Uh, and welcome uh, to the uh, meeting of the Sarasota, I would say municipal hospital, but it's the Sarasota Memorial <laughs> Hospital Board. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, members of the board and other staff at the Dines. Uh, Victor Brohe represents the Northern District. Patricia Mariah uh, represents the Southern District. Greg Carter represents the 
Southern District. I'm at large. Brad Baker is Northern District. Brett Runner is in the. Uh, you are at large. Thank you. Sharon uh, Peters represents at large, and Sarah Lodge represents the Central District. Also at the dais is Dr. Hoffberger, who's the chief uh, of staff, of medical staff. Dr. Jim Fiorica is the chief medical officer for the hospital. David Berender is our chief. Karen Marshall serves as the assistant secretary to the board. So we're glad y'all are here. I need to read a public comment for notice. Any citizen desiring to address the hospital board should turn in a speaker card to the board secretary. Comments will be heard in the public comment section of the agenda. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to three minutes. The chair may find it necessary to limit the time for comments in the interest of time. Vendors, suppliers, or other persons seeking hospital contracts awarded on a competitive basis are reminded that their ability to address the board may be restricted by the terms of the invitation for bid, request for proposal, or other purchasing criteria. Lastly, the board has established a claims adjustment review panel comprised of representatives of the board, the medical staff, administration, and legal counsel to review and negotiate the settlement of claims. Accordingly, the board will not entertain comments or discuss or negotiate claims at this meeting. So if I can, I'd like to call the meeting to order and the first item on the agenda is the approval of the orders of the day. They'll have the agenda in front of you. Is there any uh, additions, comments, and a motion to approve the orders of the day? And motion by Mr. Carter, seconded by Mr. Rohe. All those in favor say yes. Opposed, motion passed. Uh, the approval of the minutes for the meeting of April 17th uh, were distributed earlier. Are there any comments, corrections of the minutes? Got approval from Mr. Baker and a second from Mr. Carter. All those in favor say yes. 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 And opposed, and motion carries. There are no board reports for this meeting, and we'll move to the uh, number five on the agenda, agenda is the presentation of the Excel award winner for April 23. David, you're on the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have the privilege today of uh, recognizing our uh, cell board member for April 2023, who is Lisa Marin from Berlin. Lisa. Congratulations again. Thank you. Not surprised for her. She was right. Stand by me. Thank you a bit. Um, she was recognized at uh, our meeting council um, last month, and so um, I get the privilege of talking to you about you again. Okay. So our Excel Award winner uh, for the month of April was it's our early man. I'm saying it right now. Okay, thank you. A radiation therapist at our radiation oncologist in our uh, university. Lisa has been a team member since the Rad on opened in August 2020, and I'd like to share a few of her many wonderful things. I would say about it. I'm supposed to wait for that. Or... No. Okay. I'm going to wait for that. It's called it. Well deserved. Well deserved. What this next wind is. <laughs> For, for those in the audience, I feel we all share this, who do not know, but every time there's a birth at our hospital, we play Brahms Little Pack. If it's twins, twice, if it's more than that, we do here all day. So. <laughs> Back to celebrating, Lisa. 
Uh, so Lisa, a highly skilled radiation therapist, communicates extremely well with every member of her staff. She always um, puts the patient first, serving as a champion for new procedures and processes that will improve quality and the patient experience. She has an attention to detail that is second to none and is meticulous in carrying out her responsibilities. Co-workers say Lisa is a natural leader who takes the extra time to train and mentor new employees. She is compassionate and empathetic, always offering words of encouragement and praise. Lisa also has a positive energy that patients love. She always has a smile on her face and is on her day game from the moment she walks in until the time she leaves. Lisa, you truly excel at everything you do here. We're so grateful that you're here. Our community is grateful. Thank you and congratulations. Okay, now I'm going to read this to you again, but you get to keep it this time. Okay. <laughs> so, the Excel Award. Excel recipients are employees who are models of excellence and consistently demonstrate the mission, vision, and values of our organization. They are superior performers that make an extra effort in the quality and care of our patients, uh, of our patients and families in the year. A hospital board and administrative staff serves as a memorial health care system to recognize its loosened relationship with the Excel Award for April 2023. Signed by both myself and Mr. Hudson and the chair. So, congratulations. Thank you, everyone, so much. I appreciate this honor. I am honored to be here. I am grateful. I've got some of our close patrons in the audience here Tina Hall, Kelly Dancer, Dr. Brown. It's just I was thinking about this, and what makes the Excel even possible is the team that we're surrounded by. And it starts from the top and just trickles down. And the leadership starts with Sarasota Memorial, and it comes down to our director, and then my direct boss, Tim Hall. It's just, it gives up. We have the tools and everything we need. All we have to do is execute day in, day out. And our team is amazing. We can all be standing and I work with so closely. So I'm just, I'm honored to be here. I'm grateful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank ladies. you. Next item uh, on the agenda, and I would like to just make one uh, correction. I failed to mention that uh, board member Bridget Ferrici. Uh, is attending a school uh, today, and she has an excused absence. Uh, she represents the Central District, and also failed to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher uh, Jefferson, who is on the screen here. The public can't see him right now, but uh, uh, Dr. Jefferson is the Chief of Staff at the Medical Hospital in Venice. I'd like now to call on Dr. Uh, Fiorica for a joint report on that. Staff. I have nothing to report today. <laughs> Dr. Huffberger. I would ask for a motion uh, approving Matthew Waldron, MD, as the chair of the Department of Anesthesia as recommended by the SMH Sarasota Medical Executive Committee. So moved. So motion by Ms. Runner and the second by Mr. Roby. Is there any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Opposed? The motion carries. That is all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, you will recall that in November, you approved the SMH Venice Medical Staff Leadership. We have had a couple of changes, and at this time, I am seeking a motion approving the changes to the 2022-2023 SMH Venice Medical Executive Committee roster to add Dr. Heidi Kadecki as chair of the Department of Medicine Dr. Daniel Murphy as medicine chair elect, Dr. Gregory Lomas as chair, surgical chair, and Dr. Christopher Wilcom as surgical chair elect as recommended by the medical executive committee. So moved. Uh, motion by Ms. Schreiner, second. Uh, Ms. Mariah, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, motion carries. Anything else? 
Yes. yes, I have one more. Next, I would ask for a motion approving Sarasota Memorial Hospital Venice delineation of privileges forms for loop recorder criteria for cardiology and to remove the advanced GI procedures from gastroenterology, each as recommended by the SMH Venice Medical Executive Committee. So moved. And a motion by Ms. Ryan. Second. And second by Ms. Ms. Lodge. All right. Any discussion? Carry down. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Those voting carries. Anything else, Dr. Jefferson? That is all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, number seven on the agenda is the secretary's report. I'm calling on the assistant secretary, Sarah Lodge, to make that report. Thank you. Our next meeting will be Thursday, June 1st, 2023 from 8 a.m. to 11, which will be our strategic planning retreat, and it'll be a closed meeting. On, and then following that is Monday, June 19th, from 9 to 10.30, we'll have our governance, governance and effective committee from 10.30 to noon, mission and planning. From noon to 12.30, closed session. From 12.30 to 2, financial review and board issues lunch. From 2 to 4, our board meeting. Any questions for Ms. Lodge. Moving on to the treasurer's report, Mr. Carter. Speaking of microphones, I know that uh, we struggle with passing microphones back. Several members of the public as well as staff have asked us to look at having a increase in microphone, and that is being done, and hopefully. In the next couple of months, we'll be equipped with microphones at every station. <laughs> okay. Uh, at this point, I move approval of the bad debt and charity care for the month ending April 30th, 2023, in the amount of $19,180,000. Second. Uh, $183,000. You're correct. Thank you. All right. We have a motion to second. Mr. Baker seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say yes. 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 And opposed? Motion carries. Now, I would just say for the benefit of those in the audience, it may look like we moved through charging $19 million pretty quickly, but in the finance committee, we discussed the finances in detail, uh, particularly the recommended charge offs for each month. Uh, and all of our committee meetings are open to the public with the exception uh, of our strategic planning uh, meeting and also the governance. That's what I'm talking about. quality. Okay, Mr. Limbacher, you are next with financial outlets. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I will uh, introduce and go through several pages of uh, financial highlights through the month of April, seven months of our uh, fiscal year 23. Okay, uh, the graph to the left um, shows our monthly revenue, operating revenues for the system and rating agency format. Um, actual months, Excuse me, actual revenue for the month of April was 149521000 versus the budget of 132423000 Moving to the bar chart on the right, it shows our fiscal year to date operating revenues. Um, our actual operating revenues are right over a, a billion dollars, a billion five three twenty um, for the month, for, excuse me, for seven months versus a budget of 885330000 Excuse me, eight hundred eighty-five million three hundred thirty-five thousand. The next page shows our total expenses, also for the same time period. Uh, the graph on the left is the month of April. You see total expenses. Uh, the number at the top of that first bar chart: uh, one hundred forty-one thousand seven hundred one hundred forty-one million seven hundred eighty-seven thousand versus a budget of one hundred twenty-one million eight hundred forty-five thousand. To the right is fiscal year to date, again, seven months. Um, it's total expenses of 946,464,000 versus a budget of 836,000,000 and 
and 46,000. Our operating income for the month of April, the bar chart to the left, $7,734,000. That's an operating margin of 5.2%. And the budget for the month was 10,578,000, which was an operating margin of 8%, even for the month. On a fiscal year to date basis, our operating margin is 58,856,000, which is a margin, operating margin percent of 5.9%, versus a budget of 400, excuse me, 49,289,000 which is an operating margin of 5.6%. Moving on to statistics. Um, these are all year to date, the next few pages for the hospitals. Our average daily occupancy uh, through April was 889 versus a budget through April of 751. That's a length of stay uh, for Sarasota through the year, a 4.78 Sarasota campus. The acute length of stay for the Venice campus is 3.93 days. On the right, you see our admissions and observation cases throughout the fiscal year, a total of 42,977 actual versus a budget of 37,500. Next page. Of statistics, the, the chart on the left is our surgery cases for both campuses, 18,330 actual versus a budget of 16,774. Our births, 2,546 actual versus a budget of 2,615. Page seven of the deck, outpatient registrations on the left, 346,850 versus a budget of 328,601. And on the right, we see our emergency care registrations, 104,722 actual year to date versus a budget of 87,902 registrations year to date. And then finally, uh, our case mix index, the four bar, uh, four bars all the way to the right. The first one in blue is uh, Sarasota campuses, uh, case mix index all of 1.83, and the Medicare only case mix index of 1.88. For Venice, a case mix index of all patients of 1.58, and a case mix index for Medicare of 1.62. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions of the CFO? Thank you, Jeff. We'll go to item number 10 on the agenda, our committee reports. I ask uh, Brad Baker, uh, Chair of the Finance Committee, to give the report. Thank you, Chairman. The minutes of the March 20 meeting of the Finance Committee were approved. Frank Morgan, Vice President of Ambulatory Services, and Jen Storch, Executive Director of Ambulatory Services, presented the Lakewood Ranch Freestanding Emergency Room Project. The 15,000 square foot building will have 16 exam rooms, an MRI, CT, ultrasound, x-ray, and full laboratory. The site will be leased for 15 years with two additional 10-year options, including the right to purchase at the end of five years. This additional site will help serve the emergency needs of the growing, I guess, eastern part of the county. Is expected to open in fiscal 2025. Based on the above, I move approval of the construction of the freestanding emergency department in Lakewood Ranch with a total project cost in the amount not to exceed $28,200,000 as recommended by the Finance Committee. Do we have a second? Seconded by Vic. Well, any discussion about board members? Very none. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed, motion passed. Jeff Lindbacher, Chief Financial Officer, presented on the status of property insurance renewals for Sarasota Memorial in the challenging insurance market. 
Mr. Lindmeier also presented um, basic parameters of the investment policy to the board. However, that was a very abridged report that was presented for us. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the president's report related to the board chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start. Start like I uh, always do with our organizational report card. Um, and we're going to look at our five uh, different areas of focus, our goal, and then ultimately our score, what we're, we're trending towards. Um, the first area of focus is our service, which we have a goal of having a likelihood of recommending um, the uh, at a greater than 75th percentile in uh, eight out of the 10 areas we survey or more. Report to the board, we are um, hitting that on 10 of uh, 10 that's greater than or equal to the 75th percentile. I'll show you the detail on that in a minute. In the people area, we have our goal of having our new hire retention, our percentage of regular and full time and part time employees that have been hired in FY23 uh, that are still employed as of September 30th, 2023. Uh, we have a goal of having 83% or higher. Uh, we are trending higher now at 89.43%. In the quality section, we have our infection prevention, which is our combined overall standardized infection rate. Our goal is to be at 0.8 or lower. I'm happy to report we're much lower than that at 0.63. And just to remind the board and the public uh, that a 1.0 is the expected or the national average, so we already set our goal on uh, very low. In the finance area, which you heard from our CFO, Jeff Lumbacher, just a minute ago, we have our, our goal is to have our operating margin uh, be at 5% or higher. Uh, we are uh, trending just above that at 5.2%. And then finally, in growth, we have two goals, first being our inpatient emissions and ob observation outpatients. Being at 61,950 for the year, we are trending higher than that at 70,998. And our outpatient, the second goal being our outpatient registrations at 1.31 million uh, registrations on the year. And we are trending higher than that as well at 1.384 million. Looking on the detail to our patient, uh, of our patient experience report card, just to orient you on the, the, the grid, the likelihood of recommending uh, to the to the left to see 10 areas that we survey. Uh, the middle number or the middle column is our is our actual score then the national median score which which is and then finally the 75th percentile score which is what we actually compare ourselves to and you can see in all 10 areas uh, we are at or above the 75th percentile so congratulations to all of our department leads uh, that are making that happen next up we wanted to rec we recognize our outstanding nurses uh, the healthcare system celebrated Nurses Week through May 12th, recognizing the care and commitment of our more than 50,000 nurses uh, throughout the health system and the 1,000 plus patient care and multi skilled technologists who support nursing care. As a thank you for our team's exceptional work, we ran ads such as one you can see on the left, and local newspapers have shared messages on SMH.com, social media, and additional signs in front of the hospital campuses. You can also see a special video tribute to our nurses on YouTube um, at the link below. It's also linked on our, our website. SMH continues straight A safety streak in a quality review released by the LeapFrog Group earlier this month. The Sarasota Memorial Sarasota campus maintained its uh, straight A straight A safety streak, earning consecutive A's in every. Um, Rating cycle since we began participating in LeapFrog Safety Survey back in 2016. LeapFrog, which focuses exclusively on hospitals' prevention of medical errors and other harms uh, to patients and their care, releases report cards in the spring and the fall of each year to help patients choose the safest hospitals to seek care. Of the nearly 3,000 hospitals graded this spring, only 29% received an A grade. Our Venice campus has been open less than two years, and so it's not eligible yet for survey, but will be in the next two uh, years too. SMH Sarasota recognized for advanced care. Sarasota Memorial um, Hospital are um, continuing 
uh, or read designations in the following specialties, demonstrating it has the expertise, resources, and equipment to deliver advanced uh, quality care. Florida Department of Health read designation as a level two trauma center. The surveyors found zero deficiencies during their extensive evaluation and exceptional achievement, to say the least. Maternity level three uh, care uh, verification, a new recognition from Joint Commission that validates hospitals with the resources that help, us, help lead to successful outcomes for mothers and babies. And then finally, a DNV Advanced Hip and Knee Replacement Center recertification affirming our excellence in orthopedic surgery. SMH Venice celebrates construction milestone. Last month, Sarasota Memorial celebrated a major milestone in construction of a new five story patient tower on its Venice campus. The Popping Out Ceremony is in, is in the long standing tradition that signifies work has reached the maximum height. When complete next year, our patient tower will add 102 new private patient rooms to the Venice Hospital with dedicated units for surgical, cardiac, and orthopedic patients and expanded space for clinical and support departments. We continue to have our physician lectures um, on our campus and I would invite you to go to our website and take a look at all the different lectures that are coming up. Um, always informative and always um, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, well, well attended. So, uh, very, very uninfluenced by our uh, informant. Our latest podcast is Life After a Stroke, and the latest health uh, cast episode, Wanda Jackson, our outpatient coordinator at Sarasota Memorial, discusses how after surviving a stroke, SMH helps to connect patients and families with community resources needed to recover both mentally and physically. I would just encourage everyone to go on our website and, and listen, and check out all of our podcasts. Staff and family joined the fight against head and neck cancer. Our the recent annual 5K and two uh, mile, um, 5K run and two mile walk to help uh, fight head and neck cancer was a big success. Our team, including our own Dr. Peter Grossler, Fossler, head and neck cancer and microvascular surgeon with Brian D. E. Jellison Cancer Institute, and First Physicians Group participated in the event to help wear, raise awareness and, find, and support the fight against cancer. We'd like to thank all our staff and volunteers to show appreciation to staff and volunteers for all their efforts at Sarasota Memorial, hosted food truck rallies and delivered and lunch deliveries at multiple campuses this month. Uh, many thanks to our team for their ongoing dedication to community service, and I thank everyone for that. And that is my report, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any uh, questions from the board? Thank you, David. Our, our next item is the consent agenda. They were now moved to the uh, consent agenda. And we'll now go to item 13, which is public comments. Uh, I have uh, about eight uh, speaker cards. If there's anyone who would like to speak who has not filled out the speaker card, Please do so now. Let me remind the audience that uh, before beginning comments, speakers must identify themselves by stating their full name uh, and the county in which they reside before beginning their comments. Speaking time is limited to three minutes, and there will be a clock up on the uh, screen uh, behind me. Uh, I will not be interrupting you at the one minute point. I expect you to be able to. Follow that on the screen. The chair may announce when the speaker has uh, uh, concluded. Please be respectful of other speakers by adhering to your time. Some guidelines uh, only those individuals who have submitted a speaker card are eligible to speak. Comments during the public comment section shall be related to hospital issues only. Uh, number three personal attacks, abusive language, profanity of any kind will not be. Tolerated, and I would ask that speakers please refrain from referring to the Holocaust as uh, comparing our hospital to that. Uh, number four, no person attending the board meeting is to harass, annoy, or otherwise disturb any other person in the room, clapping, whistling, heckling, gesturing, loud conversation during their disruptive behavior is prohibited. Uh, while participants may leave and come back into the room, 
if your name is called and you're not here, it will go to the bottom of the list. And again, lastly, any member of the public whose behavior is disruptive or violates these guidelines is subject to removal from a board meeting or such other action may be appropriate. So, very good. We will now have speakers and I'll announce the names followed by two. Uh, first speaker is Paul, excuse me, Saul Hillstein, followed by Barbara Vaughn, followed by Ann Vanderstill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Saul Kilstein. I live in uh, the unincorporated section of Sarasota County. Um, members of the board, over the last year, you've seen the governor and the legislature pay a lot of attention to the unborn. I think it's important for this board to recognize that what hasn't taken place is the attention to the nearly a million Floridians who are going to lose Medicaid coverage in the coming months if action isn't taken to extend their coverage. At the same time, the legislature has failed to enact, and the Florida is one of the most intense states, to enact Medicaid expansion, which would cover those with incomes up to $20,000 for individuals. This is going to place enormous burdens on a hospital system like Sarasota Memorial. And with the United States having pathetic history of hospital admissions, suicide, gun deaths, maternal outcomes compared to other nations, the burdens are going to fall on the hospital system like Sarasota Memorial. And while you hear a lot about uh, how this hospital system performed with COVID, COVID is gone, hospitalizations due to COVID is gone, and with a million Floridians lose Medicaid coverage, the burdens and your need to plan for the loss of Medicaid coverage in coming months is something you're going to need to plan for. So I encourage you to be alert to this, to plan for it, and also to be aware that um, the noise in the system and the noise you're going to continue to hear about how to deal with uh, additional uh, caseloads coming with the flu with the resurgence of new variants of COVID, you need to prepare for it and you need to follow the science, not the noise of the system. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Saul. Next is uh, Barbara Vaughn, followed by Ann Vanderstill, followed by Kevin Miller. Welcome back, Ms. Vaughn. <laughs> Good afternoon, board members. I'm Barbara Fong. I'm in Venice, Florida. I'm going to begin today with a quote that I found very profound and more than a little apropos. Quote, you have the opportunity to change your society until you don't. Let me repeat that. You have the opportunity to change your society until you don't. You either don't change it because you're not paying attention to life physical, you don't care, or you just miss the time. Most of you probably, most of you here, have had the ability to change the society in this hospital just by telling the truth. If you had truly started with the patient first and the patient always being the first, you would have immediately abandoned the protocol fed to you by CDC that you've been mandated to use and you would have done instead what was best for each individual patient. And in retrospect, you could have a third party audit to fairly assess the performance of the hospital. And then there's the matter of legal representation. 
that I think you've already heard about that. Speaking of correcting past mistakes, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Cleveland Clinic. They've recently done a study designed to prove the effectiveness of the COVID vaccination. To their great surprise, after testing groups among their 51,000 employees, they found that those who had had the first jab, there was a higher occurrence of COVID. Those who had had boosters, the occurrence of COVID went up and up. And guess what? They were honest about this report. It was made public. How do you think I got it? the truth? Honesty about what has gone on and what is going on in this hospital should be the rule. Honesty. Try it. Sometimes you might like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baum. Uh, next, uh, Ann Vanderstill, followed by Kevin Miller, followed by Laura Kingsley. Welcome back, Ms. Vanderstill. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Vanderstill from Osprey, Florida. I represent the Zelenko Freedom Foundation, and I just returned from a conference in Miami where attorney Thomas Renz broke some really important information coming from two whistleblowers at Ascension Hospital System. These two individuals had a conversation that was recorded by one of the whistleblowers. You have a nurse and a pharmacist and it regards the CDC protocol using remdesivir. I'm gonna play a minute and 20 seconds of this conversation for the board. transfer. The conversation regards the CDC protocol and the use of morphine and remdesivir and the acknowledgement that they know they're killing patients in the hospital system. This is Ascension. They're a huge hospital system. I believe you're quite familiar with the scope and size of what this conversation actually entails. The lawsuits are going to start and they're going to be extremely aggressive because these whistleblowers have put a lot of documentation behind everything that they discussed in this conversation. Attorney Tom Renz is well-funded, and he has a lot of other attorneys that are now coming on board. As I've said before, your hospital system is magnificent. You do a lot of incredible work here in the community, and the community is dependent on what you're doing. This is the opportunity for Sarasota Memorial Hospital System to lead the country in stepping away from a protocol that has been proven over and over again, including the WHO, which recognizes that remdesivir is a death protocol they disavowed it in 2018 when they studied it. So please, I implore you to take the lead. Be the shining city of hospital systems across the nation and step away from a protocol that the Center for Disease Control is absolutely using to take patients not ahead into life, but take them to the grave. I thank you so much for your time and consideration, and God bless you all. Thank you, Ms. Vanderstill. Next is Kevin uh, Miller, MD, Laura Kingsley, followed by Char uh, Charlotte Harris. May have been Kevin Miller. Grandma. Tired position. Hold the message speak in the microphone, please. Where do you live? They can hear me now? Yeah. That's better. Retired position. Oh, uh, Lori. Practice in dentists for many years. I just wanted to express 
found appreciation for what the hospital did through COVID and work together as well as more. And I just want you to know that it's more work they're doing. That's all of us. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I appreciate it. Next is Laura Kingsley, followed by Charlotte Harris, followed by uh, Stephen Gavanti. Hello, sir. They are just started. Oh. Um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll reset it. So, where are you from? Which one knows? Laura Kingsley. I live in Sarasota. And I have a letter from Mr. Marinder, um, and I would like to read it right now. That's okay, sir? Yes. I hardly know where to begin. We had such an incredible experience in this public hospital, my public hospital, our public hospital. I commend you, sir, on your leadership and that of your staff. My 94-year-old mother, Rosemary Piper, had a much-needed hip replacement surgery. On April 12th, and was discharged on April 13th. From beginning to end, your staff proved themselves to be superb. First of all, Dr. Edward Stolarski is not only a genius, his interpersonal skills immediately calmed my family and gave us a sense of supreme confidence. He and his team, Julie Rice, James, Justin, Dr. Jones, the anesthesiologist, and Alfred, the physical therapist, are surely and justifiably world-renowned. Mother's pre-admission nurse, Carolyn, was lovely and took us through all the steps with such kindness that we didn't mind the length of time we spent covering the many details. The nursing staff was simply amazing. Sherry skillfully prepped mom and then Erica, the recovery nurse is the embodiment of perfection and quite a joy for mother to meet when she opened her eyes. While in her room, Nurse Dari took incredible care of mother from her sweet guidance to her ninja nighttime visits checking up on her. I cannot rave enough about these incredible women. Additionally, the ortho techs, John, Anthony, Sydney, were always right there when they were needed and knew exactly what to say and do. They were terrific teachers. Lastly, Nurse Stephanie efficiently and quickly discharged mother. As my mother said, in my 93 years of visiting hospitals, visiting, I have never had such loving, kind care, and I'm very grateful to every one of your staff who played a part in my successful surgery and recovery. Please accept our family's rent, and please know that you and our beloved hospital want, we want to continue healing and providing healing. The, you have done it with the very best policies that keep us safe. You and our masterful infectious disease guru, Dr. Gordia, led us through COVID, the most challenging time of our lives by putting a premium on prevention and saving lives on your staff and in our community. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. Thank you. I have a letter and also uh, to the foundation, my mother wrote a check for $1,000. Thank you. Thank you. If you'll leave it at the desk there. There's Stacy right there. Perfect, right, thank you. Uh, next, Charlotte Herod, followed by Stephen DeFonte, followed by uh, John Patel. Hello, my name is Charlotte Gray, and I'd like to tell you about my friend's experience who was not vaccinated, and neither was her friend. We called her uh, COVID at the same time. Her That's friend right. Mel, you live in Sarasota? I live in Sarasota. Okay, thank you. And my friend uh, came to the hospital almost a death's door. Uh, she came in, a, in, a, uh, in an ambulance. And uh, I just wanted to tell you how wonderful her experience was here in the hospital and mine as the major person who was able to keep in contact with her by phone. The staff was amazing. I was able to call and I was encouraged to call 
uh, during her three, my friend's three month stay, as frequently as I wanted. I was always received us by the staff as courteous as incredibly courteously. And if they couldn't talk to me, they made sure that they called me back. It was an incredible experience. So no one could come and visit, but yet I felt uh, taken care of by the nurses who specifically said, our job here, especially during COVID, when you as family and friends can't come and visit, is to make sure that we care for the family as well. So uh, I am very grateful for the vaccine that has saved other friends of mine um, who've been, been in danger. And I wrote a letter to the prior uh, board in gratitude. This happened about two years ago when she was uh, when she was hospitalized. She was intubated for six weeks, all all the time near death, but never did the staff shirk from updating us with the greatest courtesy and care and love, and it made all the difference to us and actually to my friend as well. So uh, this was this was an extraordinary experience. I would have given anything as my friend would have that had her vaccinated, so she did not have to face this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Stephen DeFonte, followed by John Cabell, followed by Sally Nista. Welcome back, Dr. DeFonte. Thank you. I'm Dr. DeFonte. I'm here just to thank board member uh, Patricia Mariah for working so hard to find a path to resolve my case with her help. Carol Ann and I will be uh, working toward an independent evaluation of my treatment at SMH. It's been almost two years, and I am grateful for the progress. I'm sorry I can't stay, but I have another meeting shortly. Well, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Uh, next is John uh, Bell. Welcome back. Is there a famous speaker? Uh, Sally Nista, followed by Connie. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Coppell. I live in Sarasota. The, these comments are about the COVID policy at this hospital, not about the other protocols. The four pillars of medical ethics were destroyed in the COVID response, and that includes uh, SMH, Sarasota Memorial Hospital. We need to have an independent review of SMH COVID policies just because the Auschwitz concentration camp became John, I asked earlier to frame or bring the, the comparisons to the Holocaust. So if you would please uh, refrain from it, discuss it. Sure. Uh, afterwards, could you comment so I don't lose my time on why that is? Why is what? Why I'm being censored for speaking about that. I think comparisons to the Holocaust are totally inappropriate. I'm Jewish. So for me, it's going to be fair, our hospital to that. Okay. You may continue. But just for the record, I do feel censored by that. Okay, for the record. Um, so while SMH may have performed better than other hospitals, that doesn't mean that people did not hear due to these protocols designed to maim and kill, such as remdesivir and ventilators. 90% of COVID patients who were put on ventilators Die. We need to have the three minute mark removed and set back to five minutes to give us an opportunity to you know, comment fully. We just want good patient care and transparency, and we never want ourselves or our healthcare providers to ever again be threatened with loss of livelihood if they refuse a vaccine. We also want a new position, chief of alternative medicine, a doctor who will oversee the option to use FDA approved drugs that are safe and effective. We don't trust your COVID protocols. This past week, Florida Surgeon General Ladapo, who has a medical degree from Harvard and a PhD in healthcare policy from Harvard, sent a letter to the CDC to stand for death control. Your ongoing decision, and this is expensive, your ongoing decision to ignore many of the risks associated with the mRNA COVID vaccine alongside your efforts to manipulate the public into thinking they are harmless have resulted in deep distrust in the American healthcare system. Your collective decisions to deny that national immunity can converts comparable or superior protection to COVID-19 vaccination, pushed mRNA COVID-19 boosters for young and healthy, 
and delay knowledge of this vaccine induced myocarditis and what we so doubt between the American people and the public health community. That are unequivocal. This is all part of this letter. The COVID 19 vaccine rollout, the vaccine adverse event reporting system bears reported increase of 1,700% reporting and 4,400% increase in life threatening diseases. Based on the CDC Center for Death Control, our own data, rates of incapacitation and mRNA vaccination far surpass other vaccines. The COVID vaccine. Thank you, John. Just one thing. Yeah, so I lost a few seconds before in that comment. Just one more yeah, second. Last seconds. Yeah. I got a text from a doctor who works here saying she feels threatened by hospital leadership. Is this right? Thank you, John. Uh, next is Sally Nesta, followed by Connie Bruni, followed by Sherry Weinstein. Good afternoon. My name is Sally Nesta. I'm a resident of Sarasota County, and I have no medical knowledge. I know nothing but about me. I just thought that it was important for you to hear a perspective from a resident that is not involved in any way with hospitals. Thankfully, I'm a very healthy person, so I don't visit doctors, I don't go to hospitals, and I'm grateful for that. I am concerned about what I see in here from Sarasota Memorial. I pay my money to Sarasota Memorial, so my expectation is, is that you stand up for people who live here. I'm concerned about the mass that were imposed on our students at school and that Sarasota Memorial encourage that by supporting that. I'm concerned about the stories that I hear about patients not being able to come in and see their family members during COVID, uh, with COVID policies, patients that were dying that were probably never going to leave the hospital. What a horrible thing. If my father or mother would have died here and I didn't get to see them, that would have been devastating. I just, I can't believe that this hospital would be okay with that. It bothers me a lot that you had a chance to have an outside investigation and you chose not to do it. If you don't have anything to be afraid of, then show us that. As an outsider looking at this hospital, that's really questionable that you won't allow somebody else to look at what was done. I want you to succeed. I want this hospital to be amazing. I don't want to have to drive myself out of the county to go to a different hospital so that I can be treated in a way that I think is patient advocate driven. I want Sarasota Memorial to be amazing, but you guys need to take the lead in that. You need to be the leaders. You need to be able to say, we wanna learn, we wanna grow, we wanna be better. Running and hiding and Standing behind shades doesn't look good. Thank you. Next is Connie Brinley, followed by uh, Sherry Weinstein. Welcome, Connie. <laughs> yeah, that is Connie. That is me. I'm short. Okay. So am I. It's okay. Thank you for your time this afternoon for being here, for serving on an unpaid board. On behalf of all of us, we appreciate that. And kind of just to confirm, you live in Inglewood. I live in Inglewood in Sarasota County. Perfect. Yes, sir. I am in the uh, Sarasota County portion of Englewood. We actually in Englewood are in two counties, which creates issues sometimes. When my husband had COVID last June, I did everything I could to prevent him from coming here. I did that. Thanks to other people in this room that are here today, at least one who serves on this board now, my husband became well. A personally focused protocol was put in place for him. I did not allow him to leave our house. He was driving me nuts in 48 hours because he's a very active person and he was feeling so much better that he wanted out of the house. I would not allow that until such time as a negative COVID test was present, obviously. We didn't want to spread that to anyone else. As to an independent evaluation of treatments given to others, please ensure that the word independent is truly that, independent. 
In my prior life professionally, I actually ran an IPA, an independent practice association of 228 physicians, all my bosses, all with MD after their name. I also was helpful in a credentialing program for our local hospital. Choosing hospital-based paid physicians to review other hospital-based physicians is not independent. You need to have a truly independent look at what was going on. That's what I'm asking you to do, in my opinion. And I'm not a clinical person, I'm on the financial side, so I wanna make sure you understand that. I am not a clinician in any way. I'm on the financial side of that, but I've been involved in these processes for a long time. My bottom line to all of you, I don't trust you. You have broken my trust. You have broken the trust of many folks here in this county. We are asking you to write this. You have an opportunity to do that on an independent basis. This is a very important facility in our county. We want you to be successful. You are successful and we wanna to help to make that true and continuing. Please allow an independent review of your COVID activities under the true definition of independent. Next, Dr. Sherry Weinstein. Welcome back. Thank you for letting me speak and thanks for giving my name away. I'm going to I take, that, it took you six months. It took me six months. Oh, <laughs> well, I won't stop coming until you get my name. Away. I just, I'm here without no cards. I'm here just to speak from the heart because that's all that's going to matter. And I believe that we've had. We've got wonderful people on the board. We have wonderful doctors. We've got a, a world-class hospital. And we have a difference of opinion that is, is staggering. We have patients that have been hurt as a result of that. As we're seeing, the climate of medicine around COVID, the COVID response, the COVID diagnosis, the COVID treatment, all of that has changed. Just the Wall Street Journal recently had a big article talking about how our own uh, CDC, NIH, nobody is looking at or paying attention to all the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that have been damaged by these vaccines. Now, you know that they've lost their emergency use authorization, so we don't have to worry about Moderna and Pfizer anymore. They've already made tens of billions of dollars in the past two years on the backs of taxpayers. What I'm here to talk about is the fact that our response was flawed. We didn't get a chance to have all the board members receive the, the community response to your community report. And I didn't realize that it was delayed in reaching Karen Marshall. But so it didn't get out. You didn't even have it by the time we had the last board meeting. That actually was a one by one, you know, picking apart little issues that haven't been looked at. The fact that when you pull six studies that show that ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine don't work, I can pull 10 for each of those six that show that it does work in certain cases, in certain patients, in certain doses, okay? I don't have time in three minutes to get up here and teach you guys medicine, and I've asked over and over that people educate themselves because it's important to do so. I was also told that, no, we didn't deny people the ability to get ivermectin, but, but we did. We have people that tell you that their family members got two doses and they didn't get any more. And when I gave the dose down in Venice to a gentleman, I was audited. I was I went to the QI board, you know. I, my personal medical practice has been affected. I'm now no longer given any cases to review on the quality improvement board of the hospital because I've pointed out how many more people are dying lately. Just really strange unexpected deaths in young people, okay? Whenever I bring this up, they think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but yet no one wants to look at it. If we have nothing to hide, then we need to look. We need to have someone else look at us in an independent review. We need to look at the cases of premature and, and overabundant deaths, case fatality rates for, for uh, based on our population, which is growing. We need to do this if you really care. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Steve. I don't have any other speaker card, but I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak. Hearing none, this will close the uh, public comment uh, section. Uh, under legal matters, Caroline Taylor. Thank you. Uh, as an elected board governed primarily by the rules that are promulgated by state statute, you also have rules that you have chosen to be governed by in the conduct of your meeting. You haven't addressed that for some time. So currently by just resolution of the board and some standing orders, you have an anachronistic version of Robert's rules that governs you should a question ever arise that's not answered by Florida law. And Robert's rules, which has been around for a couple hundred years, uh, is updated about every 10 years. And so there is a 2020 version, the one that you currently have as a resolution that governs your practice is from the 1990s. So my recommendation to you is that you, you could either adopt the current edition, which is the 12th edition, or you could just resolve to have the current edition of Robert's rules govern your practice that is currently the 12th edition. And then if you do that, um, there's also a companion piece, which is a Robert's Rules in brief that is tied to the current edition of Robert's Rules that is an accessible version of Robert's Rules. So if you are so inclined, I would suggest to you that someone make a motion to update, update the Robert's Rules that you would use as reference to the current edition, which is currently the 12th edition. Mr. Rogge, if you have Yes, I'd like, to make that. I'd like to make the motion to update to the 12th edition, not to the current edition, because if we update to the current edition, uh, then some future board will start with revisions that they did not review. So I'd like to make the motion to update to the 12th, uh, the 12th edition. Okay, I'll say that. any discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. Yes. Okay, I have a copy of it. Big has a copy of it, but we need to make a question. And that is, is this in the bylaws of the organization, or it's, it's just a our policy manual? It's a rule. You, you guys have adopted it as one of your standards. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't bring my bylaws with me. Some organizations did bring my bylaws, actually. I just want to make sure that's what it is. It is not. Any other discussion? Hearing none, say so raise vote. All those in favor, say yes. Yes. Opposed, motion carries. Um, other business, uh, are any comments from board members about what we've heard today from the public or any comments you'd like to have? Uh, uh, Mr. Hodgson, I, uh, I have two uh, different items I'd like to go over. Right. One is that a recommendation for I spoke about it in December uh, about getting independent counsel for the board. Uh, since that time, uh, I made some inquiries, and it needs to be, that idea needs to be filled out. And probably the best way to do it would be in a major fashion with the, the board uh, knocking around the best way to implement that. Uh, so I request that you refer that to committee. Please, I will, uh, let me refer that to the governance committee, which will be next month, and we'll put that on the agenda. Thank you. The second item is, we received a, a complaint letter from an SMH employee who spoke here in December and in, in March at the meeting, Mr. Stephen Morland, uh, technically a courageous individual, uh, and he, he wrote the letter, it's a two-page letter, we all have a copy of it, and I came across an article that was generated uh, based on his letter, I believe, and I passed it out to the board members, and uh, it, it's with reference to uh, LBG, LBTQ plus training 
that was, um, I don't know if recommended or mandated is the right word, and that we should find out the answer to that. Uh, but I would like to see that also come up uh, before the board for discussion. Everyone has a copy of the article. Uh, they, they can read the article. I think it's about five or six pages. And read his letter, which I was distributed, which we had. And perhaps, uh, perhaps there's one other issue that I just think is that in the past, our, uh, vice, our first vice chair made a recommendation that we consider having workshops, kind of like the workshops that the school board has. So we could actually, as a group, flush out uh, some of these issues and kind of come to a consensus rather than someone proposing something and just having it vote, vote it up and down, that we actually discuss it uh, and in a deliberate or collegiate manner, kind of as mandated by state law. Let me address the two things. One, I think that LGBTQ plus, uh, I'm not sure if that's appropriately dealt with in governance or in the HR committee. Uh, but I would think that if you're wanting the board to review this, that it would open to you in one of those two things. And then come back to the board with the recommendation. See? I do not know at this time we can ask, we can bring that up again if we get more information from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, the answer to that is I do not know, uh, Mr. Chairman um, and Mr. Rowe. I will um, find out in the meantime, and I can bring that answer back to the board. Uh, Will soon, I will, and, and we'll talk about it perhaps next month if we could go, uh, we'll, you know, designate a, a, a small time frame to do that. We could probably, we could probably agenda that with your, with your consent, Sharon, on the, on the HR. From the HR, yes. Yes, please. Okay, no, okay with you, but That's fine, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, and. I, I just uh, indicated that if it was okay with um, Sharon as the chair of the HR committee, that we would agenda that at the next HR committee. But that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the issue of workshops, I know, uh, you know, we meet all day and in the different committees that govern a lot of the things that Huffman does or is involved in, we are able to flush out a lot of issues uh, before decision comes to the two o'clock meeting. I don't know what uh, what purpose it would serve to have extra meetings in a workshop format. I know we're doing a workshop with the strategic planning committee on June first, where a lot of these kind of things get flushed out. But I don't I don't know where we would fit workshops into our already meeting schedule. I mean other uh, Brad originally brought this up, I believe, at the December meeting. Uh, perhaps he can flush out a little more about what he's had on his mind at the time. Brad. Do you still think workshops are a good idea? I have to set a great house for the Yeah, please pass the microphone. Thank you. A reminder. You know, there's it's a nice it's nice to have discussions of things, and typically everything we have is presented to us and we'll answer it all for the discussion. So to dig deeper on all this to do that just to understand everything better, to do my job better. And I mean even for example, Sunshine Rock is one of the things that I think is a functioning for that people but new members is something and even old people that has for years. 
on other boards, and these always put your pressure in on uh, just as, as best practice. And so I'm eager to come in at 8 o'clock before the meetings for a quick educational seminar or to come in and do this workshop. You know, so just now, you know, outside of the committee to be discussed less formally, maybe. Uh, and yet, maybe some things are part of the formality of all them. Anyway, that, that's my only comment. I'm sorry, Alex. Greg, you've been on this board longer than uh, I have. You ready? If, if you remember, well, we didn't get you a microphone. If you remember, uh, Greg, back in 2015, we were meeting uh, twice a month, uh, and it was almost too much. I don't know, but I'm going to be possible. Uh, I think it's a good idea to knock these things around with the board. Maybe we can do that. Instead of saying the morning after we finish, but yeah, yeah, just meeting after we're meeting for it. Just take time and make sure you have a certain balance. Too long, but yeah, I think kind of discussion. Patty, your thoughts? I agree. I think he's correct. Yeah, we set some time aside, maybe, in addition to our meeting, if it needs to extend to that. So, in a workshop, I mean, you know, I'm open to learning, so however it's going to happen, I'll do it. So, that's just. And as far as this goes, it's you know, LGBTQ training. Um, who implemented that? Like, as far as is that HR, I guess that's kind of where this is going to go, right? Potentially. Uh, we have a lot of programs in, in the organization that, that um, okay. educate people on um, different different walks of life, um, right. from all, from religious issues to, to uh, the one that we're talking about right now, and we make those available so people know how to. Um, take care of patients and, and um, to, to treat people to come in an hospital. So I'm wondering, the person who kind of um, is in charge of putting this together or advancing the training, which I can be part of what we are or It would be H the HR, HR vice president, right? Yeah. No, so they which... can be part of it to explain the rationale and right. do we get kind of an objective scope? Well, she would be. I mean, so so I mean, she would be the executive over the uh, that works with the, the chair of the HR committee, and and they're happy to come in and talk about it. And it, just so everyone knows, it is completely voluntary, completely voluntary. Yeah, the article. Well, let's assume that this isn't mainly you know mainstream media that that, that gets the whole article correct either. Right. Okay, it sure. is completely. Man, uh, man, completely voluntary. Well, it was written by you know, maybe uh, Chris Nelson, uh, who was here in attendance at our meetings before and was disrupted. It's not even sure who the place for now. Anyway, um, back to the original conversation that was on workshops. Uh, yeah, for instance, for instance, just one sort of. Right now, I've read it. I, I constantly get these things on my phone, all of these articles. There was an article that talked about a hospital in Boston that is now not putting the sex of the individual on the hospital records and their medical test that they're sending for testing. So, if there's a high tech test hospital level, and it's a male or a female, they're treating it the same. Now, I haven't gone and verified the article, but it didn't seem like it was just made that bad of thin air. But if we had a conversation and knocked it around, we'd find out if it's true. And we'd find out what their motivation is. Also, Boston Children's Hospital uh, apparently is doing a lot of, is doing some, uh, transgender sec, uh, surgery on minors, right? And is this stuff going to be mandated by the CDC or the, some federal government or somebody who's, gonna, who's paying the bill? 
we, we, need, we need to discuss those kind of issues. Those issues are policy decisions. They're not day-to-day -day operation of the hospital. And this board is responsible for those policy decisions. And if we know about it and we don't act on it, that's not David's problem. That's our problem. We own it. So I think we really need to be informed on these issues. So, go ahead, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I agree. I think we ought to have a, a lot of conversation and a lot of robust discussion on, on whatever issue board members have on their minds. Okay. And I do think that you can accomplish that within the committee structures. Um, I mean, it's not hard to, to do any agenda item on this. Um, a lot of times we're searching for agenda items. We go around asking board members, you know, to help us with what's on your mind. So anytime you have an issue that you would like to have a discussion, I would encourage you to come to myself or go to Carol Ann uh, and say, hey, I'd like to have this discussion. And we'll find a place to put it, on, just like we did a minute ago on an HR committee. Okay, We'll find the appropriate committee to put it on. But in addition to that, we also have over lunch, which is kind of an open forum um, for the board to have a discussion with me or any other member of management. I would encourage you to ask those kind of questions at that point, too. These are all open to the public meetings, and, and I think those I think we have a lot of opportunities for that. And that's what I would suggest, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I was going to say this is probably really a, a great topic for the committee, but I was just going to mention one thing. In November, uh, you know, we have to follow up. That's the most important. But, for example, in November, the U.S. passport you receive from the state allows you on your passport a female or X. Seems simple. I was just out of the country, and the country I was in will not allow you to come into the country to get your passport because so there's a lot of repercussions to the files of the days. I don't want to do that or not. No. Uh, well, let's get back to COVID. Sir, so this is great right for a yeah. lunch. Uh, so we're in a situation now where a funding comes from the state and from the federal government. The federal government's going in one direction. Our state government is going in the other direction. This has, has potential financial impact on the hospital. It's not a small amount of money. So I really think we need to flush these, these issues out because it's not, and it, again, it's, this is not David's problem, it's our problem. Uh, we, I think the idea of uh, lunch where we have uh, more time that's open to the public, we don't feed you, but it is open to the public. Um, maybe we start earlier in the day. Say that we, if we've got a full agenda, uh, that maybe we started at 8 a.m. or 8.30, uh, so that we have more time for that lunch discussion. I, I, I we, could, we can accommodate that if that's, a, if that's the will of the board. I would just encourage any board member that has an issue that they would have like to have there to let us know about it so we can prepare to have the discussion for it. So we're not, look, I don't know what's going on in Boston Children's or any other hospitals that you mentioned. I mean, pretty candidly don't care. Um, I'm only worried about this place, but I will, and I don't know every answer to every question that you have, but if you tell me what the topic is and kind of give me a heads up, I can make sure we have the experts around when we're having that discussion. Are we okay? Yeah. Other topics? Anybody else got anything else to go to the order? June 1st, 8 a.m. in this room for our strategic planning workshop. We call it a workshop. It's a closed meeting, but the board members. All right. Hearing uh, no further discussion, we'll adjourn this meeting.